Hey everyone, Nigel and Luke here, and welcome to Crime Zone. Last week, we brought you a list of some of the most iconic murders ever to take place in New York City. As promised, we will be continuing our theme of focusing on cases from specific cities, with this week's list bringing us to the city of Houston, Texas. It should be noted that we included the entire Houston metro area while selecting stories for today's video, which we felt gave us a better mixture of more well-known cases. Be sure to let us know which cities you would like us to cover in future videos in the comments section below. And as always, be sure to like and subscribe to Crime Zone for more true crime content like this. With that out of the way, here are 10 infamous Houston murder cases. Though the murder of Tejano music superstar Selena technically happened outside of the Houston metro area, the tragic case is one of the most widely known celebrity killings ever to take place in the state of Texas. Owing to the murder's still rather close proximity to Houston in nearby Corpus Christi and its unquestionably deep impact on the country's Latin American community, we decided to include the case as this week's bonus. Selena Quintanilla Perez rose to prominence in the mid-1980s as part of a family band called Selena y los Dinos that played Tejano music. As the band's popularity grew, Selena began a career as a solo artist, signing with EMI Records and releasing several critically acclaimed albums. Her fame led her to become one of the most celebrated Latin American entertainers of the 20th century, eventually earning her nicknames like the Queen of Tejano and Tejano Madonna. In 1991, Selena's father appointed a woman named Yolanda Saldivar president of his daughter's fan club, after she had asked repeatedly for permission to start one. As Selena's career continued to grow and she branched out into cosmetics and fashion, Saldivar was promoted to manager of the singer's boutiques. However, as time passed, it became clear that things were not working out. Many employees began to complain about Saldivar's management style, as did several members of Selena's family. Things only got worse when members of the fan club started saying that they had paid membership fees and had not received anything in return. It turned out that Saldivar had embezzled more than $60,000 from the fan club in the boutiques using forged checks. After the Quintanilla family confronted her and started plans to terminate her employment, Saldivar began to exhibit increasingly possessive and unhinged behavior towards Selena. Things ultimately came to a tragic end when Saldivar lured the singer into her room at the Days Inn Motel on March 31, 1995. After Selena told her she could no longer be trusted, Saldivar shot her in the back, hitting an artery and causing massive blood loss. Though Selena managed to escape the room, she collapsed in the lobby of the motel and later died after being transported to the hospital. The outpouring of grief for the singer was compared to displays that followed the deaths of John Lennon and Kurt Cobain. Thousands of fans, especially those from the Latin American community, traveled to visit Selena's house, businesses, as well as the place where she had been shot. Saldivar was subsequently convicted of the singer's murder and received a sentence of life in prison without the possibility of parole for 30 years. Though the horrific mass shooting of the Stay family only happened six years ago, it sent shockwaves throughout the community and has quickly become one of the city's most well-known murder cases. On the afternoon of July 9, 2014, Ronald Lee Haskell showed up at the home of Stephen and Katie Stay, located in the spring area of the greater Houston suburbs. Haskell was reportedly looking for his ex-wife, Katie's sister, who had divorced him earlier that year. The door was answered by one of the Stay's five children, 15-year-old Cassidy, who told Haskell that her parents were not home. Haskell initially left, but returned a short while later, this time forcing his way into the house and tying up the children. When Stephen and Katie returned home, Haskell demanded to know the whereabouts of his ex-wife. When they refused to tell him, Haskell flew into a violent rage, proceeding to shoot all seven people execution-style before fleeing the scene in the family's car. Despite her injuries, Cassidy Stay managed to survive the brutal attack and called the police. During the call, she told authorities that Haskell planned to continue his killing spree and was headed to her grandparents' house. Fortunately, police were able to catch up with Haskell before he could commit any additional murders. After cornering him in a nearby cul-de-sac, officers engaged in a three-hour standoff with him, eventually ending in his surrender. Sadly, Cassidy Stay was the sole survivor of this terrible crime. She would later deliver some of the most gut-wrenching testimony at Haskell's trial about the details of her family's murders. After an extended court process, Haskell was finally convicted on all six counts of capital murder in the fall of 2019 and was sentenced to death.
Though the mysterious death of Houston's socialite and equestrian Joanne Robinson Hill remains officially unexplained, it has long been considered a murder by those familiar with the case. What's more, the series of events precipitated by her death did lead to at least one other fatality, this one unquestionably a homicide. Joanne was the adopted daughter of Ash and Rhea Robinson, a wealthy couple who had made their fortune in oil. The young girl took to riding horses almost immediately, competing throughout her life in equestrian competitions at the amateur and professional levels. In September of 1957, Joanne married Dr. John Hill at the age of 26. Hill was one of the city's leading plastic surgeons at the time, according to the Houston Chronicle. Over the next few years, the couple would become well-known in the city's social circles, but would begin to lead largely separate lives. By 1968, the marriage had broken down completely, and John had left the family home to be with another woman. After threats from Joanne's father that he would pursue repayment on several large loans he had given John if he did not reconcile the marriage, he briefly returned, but continued his infidelity. The couple remained bitterly feuding on and off after that. In March of 1969, Joanne fell mysteriously ill. After three days of vomiting and progressively growing sicker, John finally took her to the hospital, where she died of sudden cardiac failure within 24 hours of her arrival. Though the circumstances of the death required that Joanne receive an autopsy under Texas state law, John had his wife's body quickly moved out of the hospital and into a funeral home. The body was embalmed within an hour of arriving before the pathologist had time to show up. Due to the condition of the body, all the examiner could say is that Joanne may have died from pancreatitis. Ash Robinson ordered two more autopsies to be conducted on his daughter's body, but neither was able to determine if a crime had been committed. From there, Robinson petitioned the district attorney to indict Hill for murder. Though many believed Hill was indeed guilty, there was little hard evidence to go on. Instead, he was indicted on a landmark charge of murder by omission for his willful failure to seek medical help for his wife's illness. Hill's first murder trial in 1971 ended in a mistrial, when his former mistress testified that not only had Hill admitted to killing Joanne, he had tried to kill her as well. However, before the second trial could begin the following September, John Hill was shot and killed in a mysterious robbery at his home. The murder happened just a few weeks before the trial was set to begin, when a suspect, Bobby Wayne Vandiver was finally arrested for Hill's murder. He told police that the killing was a contracted hit that he had been asked to carry out for $5,000. He implicated two accomplices in the crime, one of whom later corroborated his story. Vandiver himself would die in a mysterious police shooting. While many believe that Ash Robinson was responsible for the alleged hit on Hill, it could not be proven, and he was never charged with any wrongdoing. The bizarre case of Joanne and John Hill continues to live on in the public memory and has been the subject of several notable books and at least one televised film. On August 24, 1978, Edward Harold Bell drove his red pickup truck into the suburbs of Pasadena in the Houston metropolitan area. He pulled up in front of the house of Dorothy Dickens, who noticed him exit the vehicle naked from the waist down and approached a group of playing children. Her 26-year-old son Larry quickly went over to intervene, stealing Bell's keys while his mother called the police. Little did Larry know the incident was about to quickly and violently escalate. When Larry refused to give back the keys, Bell shot him several times with a pistol in the driveway. As Larry staggered backwards into the garage and collapsed into his mother's arms, he was shot again, this time in the head. Bell then walked back to his truck and retrieved a rifle, which he shot Larry with several more times. Despite being arrested near the scene, Bell was shockingly granted bail and went on the run for almost 15 years. He was eventually captured in early 1993 thanks to tips generated by an Unsolved Mysteries segment on the case that had aired three months earlier. Though this novel detail, as well as the brutal nature of the crime itself, likely would have been enough to solidify the story in the public's memory, it was what came after it that continues to haunt the city. In 2011, Bell wrote several letters to investigators claiming to be responsible for the murders of 11 girls who went missing from the Houston metro area between 1971 and 1977. In one particularly chilling letter, he referred to his victims as the 11 who went to heaven. 
Though Bell would recant his confession before his death in prison in 2019, details he provided about some of the cases were enough to convince both investigators and the families of several of the missing girls that he was responsible for at least some of the crimes. However, to date, no hard evidence in these cases has yet been found, leaving the families of Bell's suspected victims forever searching for answers. On the night of June 24, 1993, 14-year-old Jennifer Ertman and 16-year-old Elizabeth Pena attended a friend's pool party at the Spring Hill Apartments near T.C. Jester Park. When they realized they were about to miss their 11 p.m. curfew, they decided to take a shortcut to Pena's house in Oak Forest, following the railroad tracks and passing through the park. While walking down a trail, they came across several gang members who were drinking in the park after holding a gang initiation. The men spotted the girls and went after them. After capturing Pena and Ertman, the gang members took turns sexually assaulting both of them for over an hour. Worried that they might later be able to identify them, gang leader Peter Cantu ordered the other members to kill the girls. Ertman was strangled with a red nylon belt until it broke, at which point the men switched to shoelaces. As a final act of brutality, the gang members stomped on Ertman and Pena's throats to ensure that they were dead. When the girls failed to return home, a frantic search began to locate them. This would last for four days, until police were tipped off by the brother of Peter Cantu that the bodies could be found near the White Oak Bayou. The brother had learned of the horrific crime when the gang members had come to his house that night and bragged about the murders. News of the brutal crime shook the city and was quickly reported in the rest of the state. All six of the perpetrators were later arrested. One of the men, Jose Medellin, gave a written and taped confession which played a pivotal role in the men's subsequent convictions. At trial, five of the six gang members were sentenced to death. The last member received a 40-year sentence due to the fact that he was 14 years old at the time of the crime and did not directly participate in the killings. Two of the other perpetrators would also later have their sentences commuted to life, following the 2005 Supreme Court case Roper v. Simmons which decided that it was unconstitutional to impose the death penalty on offenders who were under the age of 18 at the time of their crimes. Ultimately, three of the men would be executed, including Cantu and Medellin. As a result of the case, the rules in Texas regarding the viewing of executions were also changed. This was largely due to the advocacy of Ertman and Pena's families, who successfully lobbied to make it so that in future cases, the relatives of victims would be permitted to witness state executions. The grisly 1965 murders of Fred and Edwina Rogers in Houston's Montrose neighborhood has remained an enduring source of speculation and conspiracy over the years. Most of these theories center around the couple's son, Charles, who is believed to have butchered his parents before vanishing into thin air. Charles was known as a recluse long before the infamous crime took place. He had earned a degree in nuclear physics and served in the Second World War, eventually working as a seismologist for Shell Oil when he returned. However, he abruptly quit his job in 1957 and remained mostly unemployed after that. He was rarely seen by neighbors and reportedly only left the house at odd hours of the day and night. According to those that have studied the case most thoroughly, the relationship between Charles and his parents was not a good one. He is believed to have been abused well into adulthood and would reportedly only communicate with his parents through notes slipped under his bedroom door. In June of 1965, relatives of the Rogers family suspected something was wrong. After Edwina failed to return a nephew's phone calls for several days, the police were called to their residence. When investigators arrived, they initially saw nothing wrong. Aside from the fact that no one appeared to be home, the place appeared to be in excellent shape. However, that all changed when one officer opened the door to the refrigerator. At first, he saw what appeared to be several large cuts of pork until he looked down through the clear glass of the vegetable bin and discovered the heads of Fred and Edwina Rogers. The neatly stacked meat was in fact the couple's limbs and torsos. Further investigation of the home revealed that both Fred and Edwina had been dead for several days. Fred had been killed with a hammer, and Edwina had been beaten and shot. Though Charles was the obvious suspect, his whereabouts were never discovered. He was declared dead in absentia in 1975, but the mysterious and brutal nature of the case left many looking for explanations. Some theorized that he had planned his escape to Central America and had later died in Honduras. Others came to far stranger conclusions. 
In their 1992 book, The Man on the Grassy Knoll, John Craig and Philip Rogers suggested that Charles was a CIA agent who impersonated Lee Harvey Oswald in Mexico City and was one of two shooters involved in the Kennedy assassination. The authors reasoned that the murders took place because Charles believed his mother was tracking his telephone calls. Though it's hard to put any serious stock in such a theory, the extra dimension to the case has added to the enduring mystery surrounding the murders. It remains simultaneously one of Houston's most gruesome and bizarre unsolved cases. At approximately 2 a.m. on the morning of July 4, 1991, a 27-year-old gay man named Paul Broussard left a nightclub with his two friends in Montrose, a part of Houston long known as the center of the gay community. While crossing through a parking lot outside of the building, the trio encountered a group of 10 young men, most of whom were teenagers, who were roaming the area after leaving a nearby high school party. After asking Broussard and his friends for directions, the men reportedly exited their vehicles, proceeding to attack them. Though his friends were able to escape, Broussard was surrounded by the ten attackers and was viciously beaten and stabbed. While the crime itself was horrific, what happened next escalated the incident from a violent assault case to a rallying cry for gay rights activists, initially those in the city, but eventually across the country. While members of Houston's gay community had long had a contentious relationship with law enforcement, the AIDS crisis had added further strain to the situation, and Montrose in particular had become known as a spot that was avoided by the city's EMS and police services. On the morning that Broussard was attacked, it was reported that help did not arrive for several hours. He later died in the hospital as a result of internal damage he had sustained during the assault. Following the murder, it was felt by local LGBT activists that police were not determined to pursue a conviction in the case. Large protests were organized in response, drawing 2,000 residents into the streets and attracting a flurry of media coverage. This attention eventually prompted the girlfriend of one of the attackers to call the police, and the boys, who would later become known as the Woodlands Ten, were either arrested or turned themselves in. All ten accepted plea bargains, ranging from probation to 15 to 20 years of jail time. The man who had wielded the knife in the attack, John Buse, received a 45-year sentence. Today, the tragic case is remembered as an important landmark in Houston's struggle for gay rights. In the years that followed, reforms were made by the city's police department, leading to a greater focus on hate crimes motivated by sexual orientation. The Houston City Council also lobbied for the state legislature to pass a hate crime bill, which was eventually signed into law in 2001. Serial killer Anthony Allen Shore terrorized the population of Houston for years when he began committing a string of brutal rapes and murders starting in 1986. Worst of all, he wasn't caught for nearly two decades. Shore was dubbed the tourniquet killer because of his use of a ligature combined with a makeshift stick that allowed him to tighten or loosen his hold on women's necks as he strangled them to death. Shore's first known victim was Lori Lee Tremblay, a 14-year-old student who was attacked while on her way to school. Her body was later found behind a restaurant. Shore would go on to commit at least four more crimes in similar fashion, with his targets ranging in age from 9 to 21 years old. Though Shore's third victim, 14-year-old Selma Jansky, managed to survive the horrific ordeal, she was unable to identify her attacker. The tourniquet killer's crimes would continue to go unpunished. In 1998, Shore was convicted of molesting his two daughters. Though he received only a fine and several years of probation for the terrible crime, he was required to submit a DNA sample to Houston police as part of the case. Authorities were slow to connect Shore to the unsolved murders in the area, and it wasn't until 2003 that they realized that they had a hit in one of the cases. The DNA matched evidence found during the investigation into the murder of 21-year-old Maria del Carmen Estrada and finally led to Shore's arrest. During his interrogation, he confessed to the four other crimes. Shore would be tried and convicted the following year, where he received the death sentence. He was executed more than a decade later in January of 2018, finally closing the book on one of the darkest crimes in the city's history. The Andrea Yates case is one of the saddest crime stories ever to take place in the city of Houston. Well before the devoutly religious mother would make national news for drowning her five children in the bathtub of their home, there were ample warning signs that she was a danger to herself and those around her. When Andrea and her husband Rusty were married in 1993, they announced to friends and family that they planned to have, quote, as many babies as nature allowed. 
This was consistent with the couple's hardline religious beliefs, particularly those of Rusty, and they began having children shortly afterwards. Within the next five years, Andrea would give birth to four boys. It was following the birth of the Yates' fourth child, Luke, that problems first appeared. Andrea began struggling with a particularly difficult case of depression that led to at least two suicide attempts and several hospitalizations in 1999. Though her condition appeared to briefly improve, this was short-lived, and Andrea was eventually diagnosed with postpartum psychosis. A psychiatrist urged the Yates' not to have any more children, cautioning them that it would guarantee future psychotic depression. However, this advice was ignored, and the couple conceived their fifth child, Mary, seven weeks after Andrea's discharge from psychiatric hospitalization. Leading up to the birth of their daughter, Andrea also stopped taking her medication. Things continued to deteriorate once the child was born. After being released from yet another hospitalization in the spring of 2001, Rusty was told that his wife needed 24-hour supervision and should not be left alone with the children. According to later testimony of the Yates' extended family, he also ignored this advice, believing that giving Andrea time alone with the kids would be good for her mental health. On June 20th, 2001, Rusty left for work, leaving Andrea with the children before his mother was scheduled to stop by an hour later. In that time, she filled up the bathtub and drowned each of her five children one by one, after which she called the police. At the trial in 2002, Prosecutors asked for the death penalty, rejecting Yates' plea of insanity. Though the jury refused the death penalty option, Andrea Yates was found guilty of capital murder and sentenced to life without parole for 40 years. In 2006, after it was discovered that key testimony of one of the prosecution's psychiatric experts was false, Andrea Yates was granted a retrial. She was subsequently found not guilty in the case by reason of insanity. Yates was committed to a psychiatric institution where she has remained ever since. Almost two decades later, the case is still widely remembered as a horrific tragedy. Whether you know the name Ronald Clark O'Brien or not, you've almost certainly heard of his infamous crime. On Halloween of 1974, O'Brien gave poison pixie sticks to five children while they were trick-or-treating in Pasadena, two of whom were his son Timothy and his daughter Elizabeth. Though four of the children did not consume the cyanide-laced candy that night, Timothy O'Brien did, dying shortly after on his way to the hospital. The motive for the cold-blooded murder turned out to be the money from the various life insurance policies O'Brien had taken out on his two children, which he reportedly needed to settle his more than $100,000 worth of debt. Though O'Brien was arrested just days later for his son's murder and ultimately received the death penalty, the fear surrounding the crime never fully went away. The poisoning of the Halloween candy played keenly on the public's existing anxiety surrounding children's safety and seemed to vindicate even the most alarmist urban legends about the holiday. It didn't matter that none of the children that O'Brien gave the poison candy to were strangers to him or that his motive was not random murder. The public perception became one of uneasiness towards Halloween. As the story continued to be retold by concerned parents and media outlets across the country, it lost even more of this necessary context, prompting many people to organize supervised events in lieu of trick-or-treating, or to simply keep their kids home altogether. Though geography of the case is rarely remembered as one of its most important elements, it is definitely one of the most infamous crime stories ever to come out of the Houston area. Between 1970 and 1973, Dean Corll and his two teenage accomplices, David Owen Brooks and Elmer Wayne Henley, were responsible for the murders of at least 28 boys and young men. The murders mainly took place in the low-income area of Houston Heights, and are remembered not only as the most notorious serial killings ever to take place in the city of Houston, but were widely viewed to be the worst example of serial murder in U.S. history at the time of their discovery. The crimes were centered around fulfilling the homicidal and sexual desires of Dean Corll, who began assaulting boys at least as early as 1967. Coral had formerly become known in the area as the Candy Man for giving out free candy to local children and teens from his family's candy business. The name would take on much greater and darker significance when Coral would eventually use a similar version of this tactic to lure unsuspecting teenage boys to his home, offering them rides in his car or the promise of a party. Once there, he would either ply them with drugs and alcohol or restrain them by force tying them up, sexually assaulting them, and eventually killing them via strangulation or shooting. 
But what the Houston mass murders are most remembered for is the shocking way in which Coral was able to convince his two teenage accomplices to continuously lure in new victims for him, paying them $200 for each new boy they would bring his way. David Brooks' relationship with Coral began at just 12 years old, when he was one of the many young children that received candy from the future serial killer. Coral gave Brooks cash and gifts and took him on many trips to beaches around South Texas. Though Coral sexually abused Brooks as he did all of his victims, the young boy began to view him as a father figure and eventually started spending much of his time at Coral's residence. It was during this period that he first began recruiting victims for the killer. One of these prospective victims was Elmer Wayne Henley, who Brooks introduced to Coral in the winter of 1971. Rather than killing the teen, Coral offered him the same deal as Brooks. Though he was initially reluctant, he eventually agreed. Over the next three years, Henley and Brooks were responsible for facilitating a revolving door of brutality on Coral's behalf. This would continue until the night of August 7th, when Henley made the mistake of bringing two friends to the house, one of whom was a girl. When Coral realized that Henley had brought a girl to his house, he flew into a rage, telling him that he had ruined everything. Coral then waited until the trio of teens had passed out from intoxication before turning on his accomplice. When Henley awoke several hours later, he was shocked to find himself tied up alongside his two friends. He pleaded with Coral to let him go, and was eventually freed after promising to participate in his friend's murders. However, after being released, Henley grabbed Coral's gun and shot him several times, eventually causing him to collapse and die from his injuries. He then released his two friends and called the police. Henley and Brooks would later provide law enforcement with shocking confessions detailing their extensive involvement in Coral's crimes. They admitted to being personally responsible for killing several of the boys themselves, and would lead investigators to many of the locations where they had helped bury the bodies. At trial, both Brooks and Henley received life sentences. Though decades have passed since the crimes took place, it is still believed that many of Coral's victims have yet to be identified. In an unrelated investigation in 1975, police discovered a cache of images of boys as young as eight, several of whom were known to have been murdered by Coral. This led to the chilling possibility that Dean Coral may have been involved in trafficking some of his victims, though this theory has never been definitively proven. David Brooks died while serving his life sentence earlier this year at the Terrell unit near Rosheron, Texas. Elmer Wayne Henley remains incarcerated in Anderson County, Texas at the Mark W. Michael unit. That brings us to the end of our list. Let us know in the comments section below which city you'd like us to focus on for our next video about iconic murder cases. As always, if you enjoyed our video, don't forget to like and subscribe to Crime Zone for more true crime content like this, making sure to hit the notification bell to stay up to date with our latest videos. Thank you for watching.